morning everybody and uh, let's start the uh, fourth lecture in the summer school on the machine learning in microscopy so until now we had the introductory lecture which basically talked about how machine learning is positioned to change the microscopy as we know it by allowing us to uh, analyze the data visualize the data find meaning in the complex data sets and uh, we had uh, two lectures by Professor Dusher talking about the quantification of the microscopy and what the microscopy data uh, generally means. So as you will uh, see throughout the course, quantification is absolutely important because there is this old principle of computer science that if the garbage goes in, the garbage goes out. That applies for machine learning in microscopy big time. And uh, However, today we are going to go through the first uh, lecture on the machine learning, which is the uh, methods for the dimensionality reduction for the spectral analysis. So uh, today we are going to consider only the linear unmixing methods. So we'll try to delve into why do we need the linear unmixing. And I'll show you the example of the linear unmixing, which is easy to understand meaning the multiple linear regression. And uh, then we will dedicate most of the lecture to the method called the principal component analysis. So there is a very big discussion whether this is a machine learning or not, because strictly speaking, principal component analysis was uh, invented more than 150 years ago. However, it turns out that it is, uh, lays the foundation for the whole concept of the exploratory data analysis. So how do you analyze the data if it is highly dimensional and you don't know anything about it whatsoever. I will show you several examples of the PCA for different techniques, so not only electron microscopy. The reason why I have chosen them is because very often you can understand the meaning and the logic behind the mean, uh, identification of the methods much better if your techniques are relatively straightforward. So. Uh, we'll see how that goes. We'll briefly discuss the independent component analysis, and uh, we'll go through the technique called NFindR and Bayesian linear unmixing. Now, one principle that I really want to communicate, and uh, it is something that you can use over and over again in the future, is uh, the principle that if solution exists and it is unique, it really doesn't matter how you find it. So this uh, principle applies for physical interpretation of the unmixing methods. Very often we don't know what is the kind of what the results mean, but what we should do is for any unmixing method that we have, we should look at the basic principles and constraints uh, within the method. That basically tells us how does it compare to the physics of our system. So uh, when do we need the multi-linear uh, mixing methods? Generally, we need it each time when our data is more than two-dimensional. For example, if you work in the techniques such as scanning probe microscopy, you have a whole panoply of the spectroscopic techniques, including force distance measurements, current voltage measurements, uh, different type of spectroscopies in the uh, piezo response force microscopy. If you work in electron microscopy, then the obvious uh, hyperspectral imaging is the electron energy loss spectroscopy. And this is something that uh, Professor Duscher have talked about uh, on Tuesday. If you deal with the optical microscopy, then of course you have a hyperspectral measurements, including the collecting the full optical spectrum over the image. If you deal with the mass spectrometry, then of course uh, mass spectrometry imaging is also three dimensional. So uh, in all these cases, we have a very basic primitive of how our data look like. It's essentially a cube, meaning that we explore the X and Y direction. This is our image plane. And then we explore the vertical direction, which is our energy plane. So for eels, it is uh, the energy lost. For example, for mass spectrometry, it would be the mass of the ions. For optical microscopy or photoluminescence, it would be the uh, wavelength of the light. But in all these cases, 
the important thing is that the in the image plane in this x y plane our data is sampled on the rectangular grid so which basically means that the analysis workflows that we are going to consider are going to be absolutely universal for all those cases so one uh, very important uh, thing is that that in many cases our signal can be represented as the linear combination of several of uh, uh, linear combination of signals for example if you have the photoluminescence or the emitted photons are the linear combination of the uh, emission sources in the material if you do energy loss spectroscopy then in the core loss region that uh, professor Dushin have shown the energy loss can be represented reasonably well as the sum of the loss on all individual atoms so uh, this is a very important consideration so the fact that we can represent our signal as the linear combination of signals of some elementary sources it's actually a very very powerful approximation and we are going to use it over and over again it is also important to realize that in the general case the functional form or for that matter the location of the sources is not necessarily known so the immediate target for our big data analysis is actually somehow take this data set and decompose it into these elementary sources. Another thing that is very, very important is that the convolution with the resolution function in uh, microscopy is also mixing. So what I mean by that is that you know that electron microscopy or any methods for that matter doesn't have infinite resolution. But very often we can represent what we measure as the spatial convolution of some probe function with our object. So the important thing is that this convolution with the resolution function is also mixing. So if we unmix the signal, we uh, know that the resolution is not going to make this process worse. Interestingly enough, there are less obvious examples of the, uh, of the applications, including linear mixing. For example, in electron microscopy, we have a technique called the tychography, when we apply the beam and measure the diffraction pattern so in this case each object we collect is actually a two-dimensional two diffraction pattern there are techniques like a focused x-ray where we collect the diffraction pattern which can be either in 2d or 3d and what is very interesting is that we can apply the linear mixing methods even for the image analysis so uh, this would be the subject of the lecture in uh, three or four lectures from now so in this case, the way we proceed is we take our image, we break it apart into the uh, small sub images or patches that we scan over the surface. And in this way, we transform the two dimensional image of uh, M pixels into the M divided by N pixel image where each pixel is essentially a two dimensional object. So we can apply the linear analysis methods for this type of uh, data as well. So what would be the purpose of this analysis? So let's assume that we start with the data set that we collected from the electron microscope or any other hyperspectral imaging system. So we have our basic data cube. So the question becomes, uh, what are we going to do with it, right? So collection of the data is really not the purpose by itself. We actually want to learn something about the material. So there are two ways, uh, roughly two ways, how we can proceed about it. Way number one is if we know the physical model or physical process represented by the model of where this uh, signal is coming from. Then we can take uh, this data set, sort of spectrum by spectrum, and uh, we can extract the relevant parameters from the data. So if we have the physical model, this is actually the best way to proceed. In fact, uh, kind of after doing uh, machine learning in microscopy for 15 years, the best advice I can give you is that if you know the physics of your problem, do not use machine learning. Use the physical models. You will get the answers which are interpretable much better. Problem is that very often we don't have the models. And also uh, the models can be imperfect. So this is so-called the epistemic uncertainty. 
if we try to apply the wrong model for the data, very often we get answers which are not very, very, not very useful. Our data can be noisy. So this is so-called the aleatoric uncertainty. Uh, typically physical models, if they're sufficiently robust to deal with this type of uncertainty remarkably well. And the important uh, thing here is that the analysis results generally do not depend on the sampling of the data. Now, what do we do if we don't have the physical model? So in this case, we can still learn the intrinsic structure of the data, but uh, we need to come up with the strategies for doing that. So one such strategy is the use of the unsupervised learning. So when we do the unsupervised learning, uh, it is based on the data only, uh, or so it would se seem. Practically, uh, we actually need to define things like a distance in order to do the ML. And uh, the analysis results can depend on the sampling of the data remarkably strongly, actually. So if you have a single outlier, uh, it will behave very differently than if you, these outliers are third of your data set. So there is another uh, paradigm, the supervised learning which is basically the analysis, which is based on the examples of the prior data. So supervised learning does not, is not affected on the sampling of the data in the XY plane, so this is good. But supervised learning is uh, controlled what, by what is called the out of distribution shift effect. So the out of distribution shift basically means that if you train the model by the data coming from one experiment, then it will not be very robust on the data coming from a different experiment. So if your microscope setting is changed, then the model will not work equally well. So what is very interesting is that uh, the best way to get uh, away from the out of distribution shift effect is actually to quantify your data. So there is a reason why uh, the first two lectures of the course were about the uh, quantification of the data, because if the data is quantified, the out of distribution shift effects are actually minimized. There are more complex strategies, what is called the physics informed machine learning. So generally it combines the strengths and sometimes it combines the limitation of both approaches. And I will show you one example of how it is done. So let's start uh, from the very uh, simple, simplest example of the linear analysis. So what does it mean? So again, imagine that you have your three dimensional data set Uh, you have your three-dimensional data set and uh, what you do in the linear and mixing is you represent your three-dimensional data as the linear combination of some loading maps times their components. So the loading maps depend only on the coordinates. So these are two-dimensional images defined in the image plane and the components are defined only in the energy direction. So basically the thing about the components is that they're defined in the same space as our spectra, which basically means that we can look at them and get their meaning one by one. The loading maps are defined in the image plane. So these are images. So when you interpret the uh, linear mixing results, effectively what you need to do is to look at the spatial map uh, A, and the component at the same time. And basically you say, look, this component suggests certain behavior. And this is how this behavior is distributed in the image plane. So they kind of go in pairs. So the good thing about this approach is that the, uh, our large uh, dimensional image, which is m by m times p, having m square p data points, would be reduced to much smaller number of the loading map. So if our spectral data has a uh, thousand pixels uh, in the energy direction, very often we need only a few uh, components to represent this behavior. So the question is, why is it possible? It is possible because the data in spectral data is highly redundant. So the behavior in one point is probably going to be slightly different than the behavior in another point, but really not that different. So there are very strong correlation between the spectra in one location and another location. And the linear and mixing will basically take advantage of it in order to simplify the data set. So in some sense, it is almost the same logic as uh, in the compression by the zip or any other way. 
So if you have a lot of data by data is redundant, you can compress it. And the interesting thing is that the compression very often reveals the physical meaning of the data. That's actually a kind of how we try to, how the humans understand the world. We don't think about everything. We try to find some simplifications. And in this case, the simplification is also discovered based on the data only. So another important thing that uh, I need to mention is that once we do the general linear unmixing, what doesn't matter is the order of the pixels in the image plane. So if we uh, shuffle the pixels in the image plane, our components will not change, but our loading maps would be shuffled along with, uh, along with the shuffling of the data. So these are the important elements. Now let's see at the let's have a look at the simplest example of the linear unmixing, which is called the multiple linear regression. So again, we start with our uh, favorite formula that our three-dimensional data is represented as the linear combination of the loading maps and components. And uh, let's start with the very simple example when the components are in fact known. So in this case, we collect the data from multiple locations and we want to represent it as the linear combination of, of uh, certain known components. Where would these components come from? The simplest example is to take them from the reference book. So if our, if our measurements are quantitative, again, remember the girls lecture about quantification, and we have a standard reference that we can use and we know that our measurements match the reference exactly. So there is no epistemic uncertainty here, or sorry, not epistemic uncertainty. There is no out of distribution drift here. Then we can simply use this as an example. You can say that very often we don't have the situation, right? So, or it can be too much work trying to quantify our experimental setup. So what then? So it turns out that you can make a trick. For example, if you, get the experimental data set, very often you can say that, look, here I have a tri-layer structure. So this is a strontium titanate, lanthanum strontium manganate, bismuth ferrite. I take the ILS maps across this uh, system. And what I want to do is I want to understand the system at the inter behavior of the system at the interfaces. But what I can do to simplify my life is that I can take the locations away from the interfaces as my references. So I take this location and say that this is pure strontium titanate signal. I take this location and say that this is pure lanthanum strontium interface, and this is pure bismuth ferrite. So in this matter way, I create the, uh, the uh, pure component signals based by the, from the image itself. And that's what I can do is I can take my full three-dimensional data set and represent it as the linear combination of these three. And actually, it sometimes produces very interesting results. For example, if I choose the energy window from 35 to 125 electron volts, so this is basically the core loss excitation region, you can see that once I represent my data as the linear, uh, linear combination of the reference points, I basically say that this is component one, this is component two, this is component three, and my error map doesn't show any surprises. But at the same time, if I take uh, this decomposition at the 5 to 35 EV range, where I deal with the surface plasmons, then you can see that uh, my error map shows a feature right at this interface. So basically what this analysis tells me is that in this energy range, I have some unusual behavior that cannot be represented as the sum of the linear components. And it turns out that in this particular case, this unusual behavior will actually point us at the presence of some uh, interfacial reconstruction. So very simple analysis, just a linear regression. Turns out that linear regression can actually already produce very interesting results if you know what you're looking for. But you can ask an another question. So what if the and members are unknown. So at the first glance, this problem would be impossible. So essentially what we are saying is that we, we have a mixture. We want to separate this mixture in the components, 
without knowing what the components are. This first time I saw this idea, it was highly, uh, highly exceptionally difficult to grasp how it is even possible. So it turns out that we can actually do that. We can actually separate the behaviors based on the data only if the data is multidimensional. And this is exactly what the various uh, linear decomposition methods are doing. So we have a whole uh, managery of them. The basic is the principal component analysis. There is an independent component analysis. There is a Bayesian linear and mixing. I believe the Dr. Nathalie Brun, who is uh, one of our attendees, is very well familiar with that. And in fact, there is a very much uh, large number of ways how these methods can be expanded further. So how we can inject the physical meaning into that based on the constraint on end members, on sparsity, on constraint on loading maps, uh, kernel transforms, and so on. We are not going to uh, go into the advanced methods in detail because we start with just the basic principles. But basically, uh, trust me that we can start with the linear methods and we can extend them to incorporate the physics of the system. So let's start with the method number one, which is the principal component analysis. So in this method, we again, we have our magic formula. We take our three-dimensional data set and we represent it as the linear combination of the spatial loading maps and the energy dependent components. So in this case, the eigenvectors are orthonormal and are arranged in such a way that the corresponding eigenvectors, eigenvalues, are placed in the descending order by variance. So what does it mean is that you basically take your data set, find the axis in which the variability is the strongest, then you uh, take the projection on the space, find the second largest variability and go on and so on and so forth. So this method has been uh, invented by Carl Pearson in 1901. So about uh, 120 years ago, but the foundation for it, the singular value decomposition was basically discovered in 1850. So now if you uh, have an exam in machine learning and somebody asks you when machine learning was invented, you can ask whether principal component analysis is a machine learning. And if the answer is yes, then machine learning started 170 years ago. So uh, the nice thing about it is that it reveals the internal structure of the data that best explains the variance in the data set. So the mathematics for PCA is reasonably well established. So you can read about it in either Pearson book or in Wikipedia, kind of up to you. Practically, I mean, it's probably one of those cases where formulas are not going to be particularly helpful. So I went through this variation uh, derivation several times. Practically, it really doesn't help that much in the uh, real world problem. So it's much more important to learn how to use the code and develop the intuition of what this analysis means for your own data. So at least for me, it was not possible to, de to develop this intuition from the, from the mathematics. So how do we, uh, realize the PCA. So it's really simple. We are going to show it, uh, see it in the collab in the second hour. But the important thing that before we go to the collab, it's really important to understand what is that that we are doing with that. And uh, uh, there are multiple beautiful examples of the PCA, which allows us to can be illustrated for spectra, for images, for three dimensional images. Uh, personally, I really like this example. Oops, sorry when uh, you can okay and my animation it doesn't work of course uh when you can use the pca to create so-called eigenfaces so once you have the uh faces you can uh, decompose it in the pca components and then you can resynthesize slightly different uh, faces so uh you're welcome to look at the website of the uc davis group that shows you how it can be done by the reconstruction of the uh, skull shapes. It's actually kind of pretty cool. Now, the interesting question, when did people start applying uh, PCA in microscopy? So uh, one of the first uh, references I know 
uh, that has been around for uh, has been written about uh, 35 years ago is the paper by Trebia and Noel Bonnet, which is basically introduces the multivariate statistical analysis for uh, yields measurements. So the question kind of uh, becomes, why is it worth looking at this type of historical papers, right? So it was 35 years ago. And uh, there are several reasons. So first of all, very often these papers uh, contain the elementary introduction in the problem. Equally, very often these papers have very deep insight into the principle. So once uh, some technique becomes common, people use it without uh, explaining what it means over and over again. And uh, very often the old papers or kind of introductory papers have surprisingly prescient predictions. So for example, Noel Bonnet in uh, between 1990 and 2005 have written a collection of papers about the use of machine learning, including the neural networks for the spectral image analysis, which are really precise. So in some sense, it is very interesting to read these papers and understand which of the things he predicted has been done and what have not been done. And you will see that he was able to foresee the development of ML and microscopy for quite a while in the future. And it's also a kind of good idea to remember the statement by Santayana that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So once we do science, sometimes it's a good idea to look at the papers uh, done earlier, because otherwise, very often, we would be repeating what has been done before. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, the papers by Barnett are referenced very rarely. In fact, uh, if you ask vast majority of people in the electron microscopy community, when did the use of the multivariate statistic method in microscopy started, they will point you to uh, the paper by Bosman and Watanabe mapping uh, chemical and bonding information using multivariate analysis uh, of electron energy loss spectroscopy images. And uh, the question that you can ask yourself is how comes people have used uh, the PCA or machine learning for analysis of eels in 1990, but they really started to use it broadly and big time only in 2005, 2010. So let me wait for 10 seconds so you can think about your own answer. And uh, then I can tell you your, uh, my guess. So uh, I think that the primary reason is the ease of this analysis. So if, uh, in uh, 2005, it was barely possible to analyze the EELS data set on the desktop that you have in your office. It was not powerful enough. So if you want to do the multivariate statistic analysis on the practically useful data sets, not on the toy data set, you have to have friends who either have access to clusters or to some form of the supercomputing, so some way to crunch numbers. Starting from 2005 to 2010, your desktop computer has become powerful enough to support this analysis, and the toolboxes in MATLAB or slightly later in Python that allow you to analyze these data sets become available. So in other words, before then, it is possible to do it, it was possible to do this type of analysis if and only if you have access to rather advanced capabilities. And in turn, you need to be certain that this analysis is going to be useful. So the activation barrier for doing it was very, very high. Starting from beginning of the of this century, it became possible to do this type of analysis if you are interested and you can just do it for experimentation. So this type of trend, you're going to see it over and over again throughout this course, because a lot of machine learning methods we are applying now for the data, we first apply out of curiosity. So for the last several years, we spend a tremendous amount of our time working on the variational out encoders, 
and uh, applying them to the imaging and spectral data, we discover why these methods are useful when we are applying it. We don't know in advance why they're useful. So this discovery part is a very important part of the scientific process. And uh, those of you that uh, are PIs or familiar with the proposal writing are very familiar with this uh, situation when you think that something is useful and interesting to try, but you cannot explain why it is useful. You have to try it first. Now, let me show you a few examples. And in this case, I've shown, I'm showing the examples that actually come from uh, scanning tunneling microscopy. The reason for that is that STM spectra are usually much more simpler than the ILS datasets or FUDI stem. Therefore, it is much easier to illustrate the behavior for those. And then we are going to repeat the same type of analysis using the collab for ILS datasets. So this is the surface topography image. So this is an equivalent of the uh, stem structural image. Uh, this is the example of the several of the two spectra measured from this location and this location. So you see that they're slightly different. I can also take the cross section along this line and visualize the spectral evolution from this point to this point. So if you follow this line, this is equivalent to following this direction. So of course, there are many more pixels. I just uh, kind of choose the sm small subsection. So you see how the spectra changes. So generally, in the, uh, on this level of analysis of STM, basically the width of this blue region is essentially the band gap of the material. And what I want to do is I want to visualize the change in this band gap. So the physics analysis method would be just uh, fit this curve by suitable function and uh, plot the parameters in the band gap. But I don't know what the function is, and I probably don't want to spend much time and effort in, in, into this analysis. So what will happen if I take this data set and send it directly into the principal component analysis? Lo and behold, we start to see something interesting from the get-go. And here you start to see why is it vital to understand how your microscope works and what it does. So again, look at this data set. So what you can see here is that there is a clear variation from one point to another. So these are clusters of atoms. And you also have a step edge of some sort. We don't see the step edge on this uh, projected spectral image. It just doesn't visualize. Once we do the principal component analysis, we have our loading maps and we have our components. What does it tell us? So first of all, notice that our loading maps immediately show us some anomaly associated with this uh, grain boundary. We don't know what, it, what this anomaly is, but we know it's spatial localization and we can get an idea about how strong a change in the electronic structure of the material it introduces. Another thing that is very important is always look at the scales because for example, here you can see that uh, this signal, it's an, it's an average. So the variation is relatively small. It's of order of several percent. This feature, however, so this uh, strange shape is associated, is essentially changes sign from the grain boundary to the surrounding material. So we don't know what exactly it is, but what we can do is we can use these images as a mask to special uh, separate the pixels into boundary pixels and not boundary pixels. We can average our spectra over these pixels and basically visualize the differences. Another interesting thing is that look at this uh, two PCA components. So this is a component number four and number five. They look exactly like noise. And the e loading maps that correspond to them also look like noise. So one thing that we discovered over and over again that uh, very often when we run the measurements, uh, we have some noise signals coming from the electrical plugs. This is just a 60 cycle noise. So it turns out that PCA is exceptionally good in separating 60 cycle noise and dumping it into the orthogonal components. That's a very useful uh, behavior because we basically can resynthesize the data using these components and taking out these components and our data would be much cleaner. 
The third thing that you will notice is that some of these components, uh, elder components, start to look very noisy and disordered. So some of them are associated with just one spatial pixels. So this is a behavior that will also appear in eels. So if your data is corrupted by the uh, cosmic ray noise, so there is one high energy particle going through your detection system result in the spike. Very often, a spike will take a whole PCA component for itself. If it is one or two spikes, that's not a big thing, but if there are too many of them, it's actually a problem because they never uh, separate cleanly. They also take a little bit of the useful data with them. So point is that it's much better to clean your data before you do anything. So how do you decide how many of the components are useful? So notice that if you write the PCA analysis, the number of components you get is equal to the number of your spectral points. They just arrange differently. So there are two ways how you can do that. The classical way that you will find in the textbook is uh, to calculate what is called the scree plot. I will show you in the collab how it looks like on the real data set. And then the inflection point of the scree plot tells you how many components are important. So generally, these components are meaningful. Uh, this is a uh, noise tail. So for purely white noise, the tail will be horizontal like this. For colored noise that appears in the many physical systems, it would be slow. So it turns out that uh, this is a good criterion, but it's not uh, sufficient. And uh, one of the ways how you can analyze the data is to calculate the correlation function of these images. And the generally correlation function will tell you whether there are features in this image or whether the image is purely noise. So it turns out that if we analyze some uh, different data set, we will see that the correlation function would be extended for first three components, but then you will see the eight component, 17 components, and even 42 and 47 components. So the components in between will not have any spatial information, which basically tells you that sometimes the way you can clean your data is to pick the components which contain the spatially resolved information and uh, resynthesize it in the data set. So you kind of can go from the three-dimensional data to the exploratory data analysis to PCA, filtering based on some certain physical criteria, and then resynthesize the data set. Now, uh, how does the PCA compare to the physics of the problem? So to be honest, uh, even though I tried to look fairly hard, I was not able to find the example of this type of analysis in the electron microscopy. And the only example I can give you is the example coming from scanning probe microscopy, where we measure the uh, resonant response of the cantilever. So basically our signal looks like this. It's almost the perfect harmonic oscillator and it has a, a almost ideal, uh, we basically know the physical mechanism at this formula. So the classical way we can analyze the data is just fitted by the physical model and uh, we can get the parameters of this fit, which basically tell us something about the material. So in this case, we see the defect in the magnetic system. So the reason why we started to do PCA 15 years ago was because uh, PCA analysis was much faster at that time. This took several hours to fit at that time. This took several seconds, so big difference. And in this particular case, after spending quite a lot of time, we were able to establish the relationship between the PCA analysis and the uh, functional form. It's basically possible to show that the eigenvectors of the PCA analysis are sort of similar to the derivatives of our physical mechanism. So the change in widths will uh, show up as this uh, Mexican hat type of component, the green one. The change in position uh, will show as the component which goes first down and then up. So why does it matter? It matters because interestingly, you can analyze the EELS data sets by PCA using exactly the same logic. So if you look at the PCA data set and you see something that looks like a Mexican hat, that means that effectively your peak width is changing. And if you see something that goes like down and then up, that means that the physical mechanism is actually the shift of the res or shift of the peak position in this case. 
So this is uh, what I wanted to share about the PCA. Let's quickly look about other analysis methods. So sometimes we don't want to decompose our signal. We just want to group them in the sets which are kind of alike to each other. So this is termed clustering. And uh, the easiest and most widely used method is the k-min clustering. So what k-min clustering does is basically uh, the following thing. If you have the complex data set, you basically try to separate it in the clusters in such a way that the distance between the points within the clusters is smallest, but the distance between the cluster centers is largest. Very, very simple. What's interesting is that uh, once you do that, you have to define the distance in a certain space. And if you use the Python uh, realization of the k-means clustering, this would be just a different, essentially, uh, pixel by energy pixel. Uh, what, it's a fairly advanced topic, but methods like PCA and k-means clustering can be made very, very powerful if you engineer the distance in a certain way. For example, if you have an ill spectrum, and you say that the distance is actually uh, some element weight in the, in the spectrum rather than something, uh, the whole spectrum, you will be able to cluster, uh, uh, get much more deep insight in the material properties out of clustering. So how does the k-means clustering work? Very simple. So once you have the data set, once you analyze it, you have the spatial maps corresponding to the locations of the cluster. Uh, and sometimes you can combine them using different color scales. So we'll see how it is done in the collab. And you also get the uh, mean function of the cluster, which is uh, the characteristic curve for uh, each of those clusters. That's it. And then it's up to you to figure out what it means. Now, what other uh, analysis methods are out there? Well. There are quite a lot of them. As I mentioned, uh, both PCA and uh, clustering is basically a seed out of which a very broad range of the linear decomposition methods actually grows. The good thing now is that uh, many of these methods are part of the scikit-learn uh, library. So basically, once you learn how to apply uh, PCA to your data, you can apply any other of those methods as well. The important thing is to kind of analyze what are the uh, underpinning principles in this data set. So, but just to illustrate a few more examples, so as I mentioned, PC is the orthogonal transformation of, of possibly correlated variables into a set of linear independent variables. There is another very good method, cool method called the independent component, an component analysis. So what this method tried to do is to separate our signal in the components which are additive and statistically independent. So this is a so-called cocktail party problem. So imagine that you're on the party when everybody talk and uh, uh, you obviously hear all the voices at the same time. So typically as a human, uh, uh, typically you will be able to still recognize the speech of the person that you focus your attention on and ignore what everybody else is uh, uh, talking about. So this is what is called cocktail party problem. So the way the ICA works is a little bit like a magic. So the rigorous definition is that it is tried to maximize the non-Gaussianity by decorrelating the high order momentum. Uh, practically, I will show you in the last lecture how the ICA can be used for uh, discovering the causal structure in the data and sort of why causal structure is important. For the time being, let's just look at the general formulation. So it's you start with the uh, data, you mix it uh, via some mixing metrics. Then the purpose of the ICA is basically to try to discover the original components and the mixing metrics. So let's not go through the mathematics of it because uh, it's either, it's fairly uh, non-straightforward. The important thing is that uh, by now there is a, uh, several toolboxes both in the MATLAB and Python that allow you to do that. So again, it's not really important what are the mathematical details behind it. It is important to know how to use it and when to use it, but essentially not what's inside. 
So I mentioned uh, this is an example of the cocktail uh, party problem when you have multiple sources, you have several microphones that are listening to the sources, and then based on the signal from multiple microphones, you try to separate this, uh, try to separate the sources. So let me just show you one example. So imagine that my original data is the green curve, red curve, and the blue curve. So you can see that the uh, red curve is the triangular wave, blue curve is the sinusoidal wave, and the green curve is the, is the um, square wave. So now let's assume that I mix them. So I multiply each curve by some unknown constant and mix them together. And this is how the mixed signals are going to look like. So you would not be able to see much here. It's like a mixture of everything. So if I try to run the PCA analysis on this uh, type of data, uh, it really doesn't improve my life. So I find the orthogonal components, but I really don't see anything useful. And then lo and behold, this is what the independent component analysis does. So it's almost like magic. It basically reconstructs the original data without knowing what these end members were. It's obviously not perfect. For example, you can see that the red curve uh, ended up being the minus of the original one because it's a linear unmixing. Uh, you can change the sign of the component and the coefficient in front of the component and nothing changes. But nonetheless, uh, it decomposed our mixture back into the original components remarkably well. So a good ex think, uh, thing to think about is when can this be useful for the analysis of the microscopy data? So for example, noise testing the system, understanding where the uh, non-idealities and scanning come from and so on. So there are other uh, multivariate me methods. So for example, there is a Bayesian linear mixing, which is almost the same as the uh, PCA, except that in this case, we have two important constraints. So one constraint is our loading maps are non-negative. And the second constraint is the sum of the components is one. So the linear and mixing method that I'm not showing in the tutorial, but it would be in the collab, is the non-negative matrix factorization. NMF separates the data in the non-negative components. So BLU separates the data in the components which are both non-negative and the sum is one. And for those of you who are familiar with the material science, the easiest way to think about the BLU uh, application is uh, use it in the cases where your data clearly comes from some end members, like a, let's say a spectroscopic data from the combinatorial phase diagram. In this case, the BLU is the right technique simply because the constraint that are part of this analysis method are exactly the constraint that are realized in your system. So if you have the behavior like conduction through parallel channels, optical or electronic spectra of mixtures, analyzing the hyperspectral data from the combinatorial libraries, we'll use the way to go. So uh, again, if you want to un understand how it works, you're welcome to the original paper by uh, Nicolas de Bigion, who invented it. Let me show you an example of how we can use this type of data in the unusual uh, settings. And uh, this is the problem which by now can be, a, it, it hasn't been done for the electron microscopy to my knowledge, but with the modern instrumentation, it can be done. So imagine that you have a material, you take the yield spectrum and you heat it up. So you connect the number of the yield spectra while you're doing that. So it turns out that in this case, you have a, if you have the phase changes in the system, you can use this type of methods in order to get the, understand the dynamics, even if you don't understand the origin of the spectra themselves. So we've done this type of game for scanning probe microscopy a, a few years ago, where we were using the uh, microscope to take the images and at the same time hit the sample. So here we get the Raman spectra, but uh, it can be yield spectra at the same time. And uh, what we do is we uh, change the temperature in use by the laser and we can observe how the phase composition and the system changes. So we have some signal that tells us the change of the phase signal. 
we also can observe how the spectra changes the function of temperature. We don't know what the spectra represent, but we know that they are a linear combination of uh, three phases that are present in the system. One phase does not depend on temperature. One phase disappears during the temperature increase, and another phase appears during the temperature increase. So it turns out that in this case, we can use the Bayesian linear mixing to simply decompose the spectra of the individual phases. That's actually awesome because uh, you can use the same type of logic to any problem when there is a dynamic change of the composition that you re register through the spectral signal. For example, it can be uh, yields of the variable temperature measurements. It can be uh, Raman. It can be any other imaging technique. So, uh, OK. So what else is there out there? So let me show you one more example of the physical, uh, physical data analysis. And after that, we will switch to the, uh, to the uh, notebook. So as I mentioned, uh, physical analysis of the multivariate statistical results is actually a fairly complicated. And basically, it requires a collection of guesses. So we need to keep in mind what our postulates and basic principle of the analysis method were. We need to look at the data and uh, see what it looks like. And then we have to go forward and backward between the uh, physical meaning, between the spatial maps, and between the spectral components. And the example where it worked for us was the uh, complex type of spectroscopy on the uh, composites between the two oxides, where we expect that the conductivity of one phase, another phase, and the interfacial phase are going to be different. So in this case, we can collect the very high dimensional spectroscopic data sets. It's really not clear what they show. So the data, it's clear that there is a very rich structure in the data. But if we look at the cross sections, then the data is really very noisy. So we don't see much. So it turns out that if we apply the Bayesian linear unmixing, we start to have the components which are absolutely trivial to interpret. For example, our one component is almost the linear, it's ohmic conduction, and it is manifested in some grains. Our second component is nonlinear. It is still non-hysteretic, but interestingly enough, we see that the same grain can have a poor shell structure where the core have one type of conductive behavior, like this one. So this is maximized here. The shell has a different type of conductive behavior. We have the component, which is uh, almost 0. So this is the matrix. And then we have a component that has a hysteresis that is actually localized at the interfaces. So this is uh, almost a textbook example of how the linear and mixing methods should work. Uh, most of the time, uh, most of the time you have too many components and the interpretation is actually not straightforward. But sometimes you can do this type of analysis and then uh, you can try to feed the components using the physical models. So in this particular case, it worked. We were able to choose the right physical model. We were able to take the, uh, use the multivariate statistics in order to separate our data. And we were able to uh, fit our separated data to the physical model. And we know that in this case, it is justified because the physics of the process is matching the physics of the nonlinear and mixing. But as I mentioned, this is unusual. Most of the time, you cannot do that. So uh, just to finish the uh, overview is that I've shown you an example of the purely data-driven, the PCA. I've shown you the examples of slightly more complex methods, including the uh, Bayesian linear and mixing IC and uh, ICA. In the collab, we are going to show th go through a few more methods. But uh, first, let me know if there are any questions. Yep, exactly. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great paper. Uh, okay, then another question from Abe, does supervised learning depend on having a physical model? 
Uh, that's an excellent question. So generally, once we use the uh, once we use the uh, machine learning model, very often we can say that we don't have a physical model. So if we use the PCA, PCA is a purely data-driven method, so it doesn't require any physical model. If we use the uh, techniques such as Gaussian processes, we also don't have the physical model at the first glance. It is not exactly true because whenever you have a machine learning model, there is some form of metrics that is used in the foundation of this model. For example, when you use the PCA, you implicitly say that you plot your data in the high dimensional space where each dimension is actually the pixel in your spectrum. When you use the k-means clustering, you have to define the distance between two spectra. And the definition of the distance is where the physics comes into the machine learning model. So if you change your metric in your space, so rather than uh, whatever mean square mean uh, uh, square distance like normal one, you choose the more complex uh, metric, you can introduce the additional physics in the model. That being said, uh, the physics was there in the first place. Once you go for more complex linear and mixing models, for example, you can run something like a PCA, but you can add the sparsity constraint. For example, you can say that I want to represent my three-dimensional data set as the linear combination of the spectra, but I want to make sure that at each point of my XY plane, I have no more than three uh, components. So it's almost like a ridge regression, almost like a ridge regression. So in this case, you add the extra physical meaning. And here the trick is that you need to add this meaning based on your knowledge of physics. For example, if you, again, I really like the combinatorial, uh, combinatorial uh, material synthesis. So in this case, we know that from classical thermodynamics and the Gibbs phase rule that uh, at each point on the two-dimensional phase diagram, we can have no more than three components. And in fact, uh, most of them will have only two components. So in this case, the constraint, sparse, linear, and mixing of spectral data uh, requires to have this sparsity constraint. In this case, our individual components will uh, be will have the specific physical meaning. Uh, for AFM image analysis, uh, while performing PCA, there uh, do we need to have uh, multiple images? Aha! Uh -huh. So this is a, a great question. Notice that I've shown the analysis of the hyperspectral data set, where each pixel actually has a spectrum. So uh, whenever you apply any kind of analysis for data, you need to, I mean, machine learning community has it done exceptionally well. So you always define what are your features. So for the analysis that I have shown here, features are individual spectra. So we don't have targets because this is not a supervised or regression problem, uh, except for, of course, the uh, linear reg regression, of which is kind of regression by definition. But uh, ultimately, uh, here the, the features are spectra. We also can have more complex features. For example, if I have a two-dimensional image, I can split it into the patches and I can use the patches as the features and then the loading components will be defined in this reduced space. So it is possible to use this method to analyze the two-dimensional data. The question that you need to ask yourself is that if you do that, uh, kind of why would you want to do that? So I'll show you the example in the lecture in a few uh, days from now, where we use this type of ana analytics, but we do the Fourier transform on the image. So why would we do that? We will do that because if we have a patches and apply the Fourier transform, then we sort of get rid of the translational invariance. So once you do the Fourier transform, the translational part becomes a phase and the structural part is basically separated from it. I mean, down to the edge effects, of course, but still it works. And uh, you can apply other transforms. So I will show you the pipelines of using the uh, 
uh, we had uh, we can apply other transforms like random transform to find the preferentially oriented features and so on and so forth. But let's talk about it on the lecture when we talk about the linear methods for image analysis. It would be uh, more dedicated to it. So now, this being said, uh, let's go to the uh, let's go to the uh, oops let's go to the uh, GitHub. Let me share the screen here. So if you go to the GitHub, uh, let me share the screen. What is it here? So this is uh, our lecture number four. Uh, let's open it in Colab because uh, uh, that makes it much more interesting. So what this uh, what this Colab contains is the collection of the several tools for uh, denoising the data and several examples of uh, using the PCA, NMF, K-means clustering, Gaussian mixture model, and as the price gave the supervised linear regression for the spectral data. So this uh, notebook was uh, largely done by Rama Vasudevan, who is currently, who is one of the organizers of the school and who is now in the airplane from India to US. So, uh, and uh, the EELS data was acquired by Kevin Racapriori, who is also the co-organizer in the school. So, uh, yes, of course. So what do we do here? So first of all, many elements in this notebook are based on the uh, pycroscopy uh, ecosystem that Rama is the primary maintainer is. So pycroscopy gives us the opportunity to effectively open and work with the data in the instrument specific formats. In principle, if you have the data in the form which is already a uh, NumPy array, we can use the simple, uh, simple scikit-learn to analyze it. But in this case, let's start with the Pycroscopy installation. Uh, let's uh, install the NumPy and Matplotlib. Uh, this useful tidbit of code basically allows us to represent the data as an object where we can scroll and visualize. And uh, let's first dive into the uh, general signal processing and uh, how we clean the data. So imagine that you have a large data set right out of the microscope can be eels, can be something else. The, always the data comes with the noise. So how are we going to get rid of the noise? So the good thing is that uh, Python has an exceptionally large ecosystem of the noise cleaning. And uh, let's, play with the, let's play with the synthetic data. So let's just create a data set, which is uh, essentially two sine waves. And uh, let's uh, visualize this data set. So this is our uh, data set, uh, and uh, this is, uh, and we add a little bit of the noise with that. So feel free to experiment with these uh, uh, notebooks. In fact, you will derive the most benefit from first experimenting with the notebooks that we provide in the during this school, and secondly, trying to apply these notebooks to your own data set. So you use, you can work with the dummy data sets or the data sets that we give in order to develop some, intu uh, some intuition of what the parameters mean and how kind of to adjust them. But the real value will be generated once you start to use it for your own data sets. And as I mentioned several times, feel free to uh, drop me and my uh, colleagues questions if something is not working. But anyway, so once we synthesize the data set, we provide our, uh, our parameter space we provide uh, how much noise we want to have, then we generate our signal. And this is how the signal looks like. So this is essentially the two sinusoids corrupted with noise. So how can we clear uh, this data? So the good thing is that uh, SciPy or the scientific Python has a very large connect collection of the signal filters, including the median, savitsky galay Wiener filter, and so on and so forth. So the interesting thing is that all these filters have their own theory behind them. So when you see a simple function in Python, it is almost a safe bet that this simple function will have uh, hundreds and thousands of papers and uh, 
decades of investigation before it actually becomes simple. The uh, good thing is that we can use them. One thing, as I mentioned by Santayana, uh, it is worth knowing the past. Sometimes before you use this uh, functions, it's really worth looking at what are their arguments. So what kind of controls they allow. And sometimes it's really good to, to look at the Wikipedia to find out what is their history and what, is, what it means. So from my perspective, it is curious, but it is also uh, essential to be able to use these filters in the right way. So you will find out what can the filter do? Uh, what do you gain? What do you lose? Because there is no free lunch. If you, if you use some technique to make your data better, you always need to ask a question, uh, what is that that you are doing? Where does this improvement come from? Uh, I can give you quite a few uh, paradoxical uh, stories from the history of say scanning probe microscopy, where uh, very often if your microscope does not work and generate almost noise, if you apply the Fourier filtering, you start to look something like atoms. And this of course is not real, it's just the result of the filtering. So filters are powerful. Uh, they can introduce you new meaning to the data. The best way to deal with it is to experiment and read about how the filter works. But as I said, the nice thing about the uh, Python now is that we can actually uh, apply these filters. And essentially, all we have to do is to take our data. Look how simple it is. You take the data, you apply the filter, you provide one parameter which is for median filter is the kernel size, for savisky galay it's the window length and the order of the polynomial, for the Wiener filter is the uh, certain size, and then you can see what they did with the data. So the median uh, filter made the data smoother, but it kind of adds a little bit of boxiness. It's not a surprise because basically what the filter does, it basically averages the point with its neighbors. So the noises become almost uh, flat segments. savitsky galay filter tries to do the filtering based on the local polynomial approximation. So it is generally much better on reproducing the uh, features. Uh, Wiener filter is uh, actually a very powerful filter operating in the Fourier space. It actually works, uh, kind of looks best of all of them. So it is fairly straightforward to experiment with them. So let's say that rather than using the kernel size 5, I, can, I want to choose the kernel size 15. So in all of these uh, filters, see what happens. So if I run the code, you can see that this become horrible. So it was really not a good idea to do this way. But uh, the Wiener filter start to look almost ideal. So obviously, the important thing here is that it's kind of important to compare the filter signal to the uh, sorry, Savisky Galay become almost uh, awesome. It's important to compare the filter signal with your original signal. Then you will develop an intuition of which filter is worth using and which filter is not. So as an exercise, try to do it by yourself. So you have the access to the uh, signal, uh, which is uh, wave one plus wave two plus noise. So you can very clearly create the signal, which is uh, Y without noise but just taking these parts uh, and uh, comparing them to the original data. It can be very instructive and then you will immediately see what type of filter works best and what type of filter does not work best. So we can experiment with the uh, sizes as well. So for all of these filters and uh, kind of now we do it at the same time and you can see how the uh, raw data look like, how the median filter behaves as the function of the window size, how does the savitsky galay filter behaves as the function of window size, how the Wiener filter depends on the function of window size. So in all cases, the more filtering you apply, the more smooth is your data, but at the same time you start to uh, kill the uh, small features. So that's inevitable because if you have a small feature and you try to do averaging, then uh, the filter will essentially treat this feature the same way as the noise. There are other ways to do the filtering. So another way to do the filtering is to do it uh, in the Fourier space. And again, remember that once we deal with the data, 
we should always think about what is the physics of our uh, data and the physics of our filtering process. So for example, uh, if I have a data that represents something periodic, for example, the, in electron microscopy, it's obvious, we always have the uh, atomic, for high resolution, we have uh, periodic features. This is the case where the Fourier filtering can be most justified. So we can uh, define our Fourier transform. So in this case, we have uh, essentially two peaks for plus uh, wavelengths and two peaks for minus wavelengths. So it's not surprising because we, our original signal was two sine waves. We can find the peaks and uh, uh, simply by finding the maxima in the, uh, using the uh, sort algorithm. And then we can reconstruct our data by the use of these two components and uh, we can plot the Fourier uh, filter signal. So in this case, we basically reconstruct the data in almost ideal form because we know that our original data set is two sine waves and we use the Fourier filter that is essentially two sine waves. So we discover what we, uh, what we wanted. There are other filters. So we can use a bandpass filter. So the bandpass filter basically tries to uh, find the uh, central frequencies in the image. And then it tries to reconstruct the whole signal keeping only the band of those those frequencies. In fact, during Professor Dushal lecture, uh, the first Professor Dushal lecture exactly a week ago, he have shown exactly the use of the bandpass filtering, but on the diffraction data. So in this case, he operated not in the one-dimensional Fourier space, but in the two-dimensional Fourier space. Uh, what else can we do? So remember that I mentioned that uh, if you know the physical model, and this physical model is correct, which is kind of where uncertainty comes from, uh, it is always better to use the physical model rather than the machine learning. And in this case, uh, the natural way to filter our data is to take the physical model, which is basically two sine waves. So that's it. We know that our data is uh, two sine waves plus noise. We take the physical model, which is two sine waves. The only thing is that uh, we, don't know when we fit, we don't know what are the parameters of this model. So it's a sine wave, so we know the form, but we don't know the wavelengths and we don't know phases. So the way that we did deal with this type of problems is we use the curve fit function from the SciPy optimize. And basically we take our uh, fitting function, we take our uh, data set, we have to provide the initial values for the parameters. And then we uh, basically fit our data and we also have access to the covariance metrics. So the fit will be something that we can compare with our values. So this is our uh, phases and uh, uh, periodicities. And the correlation matrix basically tells us how good the fit is. In fact, uh, this type of approach is exceptionally important and one of our lectures going forward would be the use of the Bayesian inference, which allows us to do this type of operations when the model is known very only partially. And the reason why we would need to do that is because uh, the Bayesian inference will allow us to answer the question of how good a microscope we need to, uh, how good a microscope we will need in order to resolve a specific physical phenomena. So kind of, do I need to do it on the microscope locally? Do I need to go to some user facility or is the microscope that I need to study some specific physics is not even out there. So uh, specifically for the, this case, we care about the diagonal values of the covariance matrix. So this is basically error bars on our uh, data. And then we can uh, compare our data and the fit using these two, uh, two models. So this is uh, kind of the simple filters. Uh, you're welcome to experiment with this data set. So try to simulate different data, for example, rather than sine wave, use the polynomial function, import your own spectral data example, or you can even import the image and uh, try to fit the single line on the image. So it can be quite interesting. Now, 
What about machine learning? So for the time being, I've shown you the methods that are actually fairly old and well-established, and strictly speaking, uh, not machine learning. So it turns out that ML also have a collection of tools that can be used for the uh, denoising of the data. So this can be a nearest neighborhood, key nearest neighborhood analysis, decision tree, and Gaussian processes. So these methods can be used for the same type of application, meaning the denoising of the data, but they will vary very uh, strongly in terms of complexity and sort of intellectual depth of what can be they use for and how they can be applied. So k nearest neighbors is a relatively simple method. So it basically takes the average value of the uh, nearest neighbors in order to uh, provide the better estimate for the acquired point. Decision tree is a relatively simple to understand as basically making the decisions of how to represent the data. So it's kind of, you know, almost like how you think that if the, uh, if I look outside and, the, uh, and there is rain, I will take an umbrella. And if it doesn't rain, that I'm not going to take an umbrella. But then the next level of decision tree can be if it uh, doesn't rain, but I see a cloud, I will want to look at the weather channel. And if it says that it's likely to rain, uh, then I will still take an umbrella. So this is an example of the decision tree. Uh, the difficulty here is that uh, how do you apply the decision tree for smoothing the data? That's a little bit more uh, difficult. And uh, the third technique that we'll look at is the Gaussian processes. So Gaussian processes is a very, very special topic. We're actually uh, going to uh, use several lectures to go through the Gaussian processes at length because Gaussian processes are a foundation of the automated experiment. But we can even use them for much simpler problem like uh, denoising. So let's look at the key nearest neighbors. So in this case, we start with the subset of the data, and uh, then we train our the key nearest neighbor algorithm, and uh, we see how the, we reconstruct the noise for reconstruct the data for all, uh, for the full data set. So we can use the random forest. So random forest is essentially the combination of the multiple decision trees. So we can do the same uh, type of thing. We can uh, apply the random forest to our data set. Then we can apply it to our full data. And then uh, you see how the uh, data is cleaned. And uh, you can compare the different uh, behaviors. And now, uh, so this being said, again, feel free to uh, feel free to experiment with either random forest or with the Gaussian processes. Uh, see how things behave depending on the parameters of the model. But now let's actually go into the principal component analysis uh, and uh, non-negative matrix factorization. So, in this case, we are going to use the uh, again, we are going to use the uh, standard scikit-learn uh, decomposition methods. Uh, we are going to take the real uh, ELS data sets. And uh, so now we download them. And now let's see what this data sets look like. So in this particular case, this is the ELS data acquired on the uh, plasmonic nanoparticles. So you can see that this is uh, several nanoparticles in a row. Uh, this is the kind of empty space. And uh, this is the nanoparticle. And this is when the nanoparticles are bunched together. So this is the region where we have, uh, uh, where we have the single layer of nanoparticle. And then we have a second layer on the top. Uh, this is a kind of weird region where we look at the nanoparticle at some different angle. And kind of these examples are chosen that they're interesting structures. So this is a standalone nanoparticle and the edge and some, uh, something strange. This is a long edge. Uh, this is a kind of uh, dimer strand, strand, except that we see here that the nanoparticles have a different orientation. And uh, here we have the several additional nanoparticles. Now, why do I show you this data set? And why do we have uh, so many of them? Because this is a classical setting 
in which we are going to use the principal component or NMF analysis to find out if there is any interesting physics inside our data set. So the way we uh, work here is that we formulate the scientific hypothesis or scientific question, if you will, and then we try to find out uh, whether the machine learning can help us answer this question. So in this case, for example, we can ask a question, do we expect a different plasmonic behavior in this region versus this region? In this case, we can ask a question, do we expect a different plasmonic behavior whether the nanoparticles are arranged like this versus where the nanoparticles are arranged like this or whether the nanoparticles are arranged like this. And this is exactly what the uh, PCA and NMF can tell us. So the way we are going to answer it, let's choose some data set. For example, let's choose the data set number four. Uh, let's uh, load the file corresponding to this data set. Uh, let's uh, create our data object. And uh, let's see what our, oops, we are out of bound because of course this is, uh, uh, this data set is narrow. Okay, let's make it. So let's uh, examine how this data set looks like. So in this case, uh, I mean, of course, it's important to choose the locations inside the data set. So 30 is out, okay. Here we go. So this is our data set. This is a cross section. These are the spectra. So notice that uh, you already can recognize what this looks like. So this is the uh, spectral curve in uh, this location. Uh, this is the spectral curve in this location. And uh, this image represents the slice of our data cube according to this slide. So let's uh, play a little bit. So for example, uh, let's see how the things will look like if we choose the location uh, corresponding to this peak. So this is roughly 250. So let's see what we look at. So as you can see, we actually see something. We see that the edges of these objects are more shiny, uh, so have high intensity. So this is essentially the edge plasma. Now let's look at this one, which is about 400. So in this case, you can see that now these edges are shined up. So that was corners, these are actually the edges. So we actually can learn something about our data if we look at it uh, uh, slice by slice and uh, visualize uh, the data in space and kind of compare the spatial features. However, this is actually very, very inconvenient because uh, if you have multiple peaks, you have to go forward and backward many, many times. So as I mentioned, that's exactly what the PCA and NMF can help us do. So let's start with the PCA. So in this case, we start with taking our data, getting the parameters of the data. Uh, of course, our data is three-dimensional, so we need to reshape it to become uh, uh, two-dimensional. So we put the spatial dimensions into one direction and we put the, keep the energy direction as it was. We normalize. So one very important point, when you normalize the data, always pay attention to what the normalization does. So one way you can normalize the data is to take all your data set, find the maximum throughout your whole data set and normalize by this maximum. In this case, only one point in the data set will be one and uh, all other spectra will have the maximum which, has, which are not one. In this case, we preserve the relative variation of intensity between the different spectra. There is another way to uh, normalize the data. You can take each spectrum and normalize them one by one. In this case, each spectrum would be from zero to one. So in this way, the amplitude of or maximum intensity of each spectra has become a separate variable. And ideally we want to keep this variable and also look at a special distribution. But what we will analyze would be the shape of the spectra, but not the amplitude. So very important, uh, very important is the So in this case, we uh, basically uh, 
do it uh, overall. Uh, we uh, can look at our scree plot. So this is the eigenvectors as the function of the number of component. And as you can see, we have a very clear corner. So we kind of feel that first four or five components are meaningful. And after that, we have a noise. Let's visualize these components. So here you can choose how many components you want to visualize. And uh, then you can uh, represent them. And uh, this is how the typical analysis of the uh, data by the PCA look like. So lo and behold, we instantly starting to get the answers to the questions that we're interested in. So in fact, 10 years ago, if you run an analysis like this and this, uh, make a picture, you probably can already write, write a paper in a pretty good journal. So what do we see here? Look at the first component. So the first component clearly uh, doesn't show much variability between normally ordered particles, differently ordered particles. There is some difference for uh, double particles. Uh, but you basically can see that there is a big difference between the particle and the substrate. The component that is responsible for it is dominated by the zero loss peak, as we kind of could expect. And there is some change in the plasmonic structure. Let's look at the second component. So the second component already starts to show us something very, very cool. So notice that the signal here is zero in the substrate. It is almost zero inside the particles, but this component uh, is lit up at the edges of our plasmonic nanosystem. So basically what this component is, is exactly the surface plasma. It is, uh, you can see where the energy is. Uh, the shape of the peak is fairly kind of uh, non-Gaussian, but because we have variability across the edges of our particle. And uh, we look at the special localization to find out what it is. Notice that something interesting happened here. We don't know exactly what it is, but we'll find out. Now, what about the third component? So this now becomes super interesting. So the third component is strongly positive on the edges of this chain, but it also has the additional dynamics. Looks that this double structure here, it also generated the small variation of this component. So this is basically our uh, corner plasmon. It manifests at this corner, this corner, but interestingly enough, it also manifested at the two edges of this uh, second layer. And we basically can visualize this in real space. So this is actually really cool because this is a unique power of the electron microscopy and why it is a really exciting thing to do because we start from the object which is a collection of nanoparticles. From the physics textbooks, we know that uh, these collections of nanoparticles can support the quasi-particles, the plasmons, and the plasmon intensities will depend on the geometry. If we try to solve the uh, Maxwell, uh, Maxwell equations to visualize these plasmons, it would be fairly complicated. It will take us quite some time and effort, so it's not trivial. But if we take the ILS data and we apply the relatively simple machine learning method, all of a sudden, all this very exciting and complex physics start to be visualized in the real space. And we can basically recognize it. It's just right in front of our eyes. Now, speaking about uh, slightly less, uh, slightly less uh, exciting things, let's look at the remaining components. So what do they mean? For example, what does this component mean, component number? Uh, four. It actually doesn't mean, doesn't look like much. It actually shows the horizontal line. Based on the experience working with these methods, horizontal lines means the certain change in the microscope setting. So this is a out of distribution shift, something change in the very, very little, but something change in the way your spectrometer worked. What about this one? It's actually kind of interesting because in this case, you see the feature which goes down and up. So remember, I showed you for the example of the band excitation SPM, the down and up feature generally means the shift of the peak. And you can say that maybe there is a shift of the peak in these features. So the remaining features, uh, for me, this looks like a change in the 
setting of the microscope and the out of the distribution shifts. So the uh, features are not very pronounced. The signal is dominated by the changes in your zero loss peak. So not much you can say here. Now, the interesting experiment that I encourage you to do is to run the same experiment when you either deconvolute zero loss peak as Gerg have shown you, or you simply take the spectral data set and rather than analyze the full data set, you basically take a slice starting from this energy uh, when the zero loss peak is simply not a part of the process. In the meantime, let's look at the, another data set. So I showed you the example of this data set. Let's look at the data set number three. Or maybe number nine. Let's look at the number nine. So let's repeat the analysis. Uh, again, uh, we already see something here. Notice that for the point here and here, we see the rather drastic difference between the spectra. And notice that we don't see the particle over here. So let's see if the PCA and NMF can allow us to do it better. So we look at our scree plot. So we think that we have three very strong components. Uh, we have the noise tail. Generally, based on the scree plot only, we cannot make any conclusions whether this is noise or real. We need to look at the uh, analysis result for that. And lo and behold, this is the analysis result. So this is our uh, first component. It shows only the edges of the particles. Particles themselves are dark, and the single particle is dark. So in some sense, you can argue that this first component demonstrates, uh, now shows the physics of the particle-particle interaction, so the plasmon that emerges as the result of the interaction, but not the plasmon associated with the single particle. And you get this conclusion by comparing the images of the multiple particles present and the single particle. The second component is clearly shows the particles itself. And then the subsequent components, interestingly, start to show some details about what are the internal interactions and in the particles are. So you see that uh, this component shows something on the edge, but it's dark inside. And it also shows you the plus minus feature here. This one clearly shows some form of the edge behaviors. So the shape of the curve is fairly complicated, but you can clearly see the spatial localization is when the particles are not touching each other, but at some distance from each other. So this is our uh, edge plasmons, and so on and so forth. High order components start to be the mixture of the physical mechanisms and then the noise signals inside it. Now let's compare the PCA and the NMF analysis. So rather than running PCA, let's substitute this by NMF and uh, run it again. So what do we see? Ah, here we go. So uh, these are the NMF components. So note first and foremost that NMF components uh, cannot be uh, cannot be negative, which basically means that the NMF always have this kind of cut from below feeling. Secondly, unlike the PCA components, NMF components don't have any special ordering about them. So you, if you have 10 components, the one that you care about can be anywhere. And in this particular case, you can again look at the special localization of the signal and figure out which components are interesting and which ones are not. So presumably this one shows us the edge plasmon. This shows us the particle behavior. Uh, this one shows the centers of the particle. Uh, these are all probably noise and the changes in the microscope setting. So this kind of noise lines are very, very characteristic. So this being said, uh, we can also try, remember I told you that uh, we can use our analysis in order to find the number of the meaningful components. So this is the case uh, where I want to make a small foray into the large language models and uh, say that, you know, if you want to do the machine learning five years ago, uh, 
you need uh, you uh, needed to have a reasonably good uh, Python background. So you need to go through several courses. You need to know the basics. And for the things that you don't know, you will have to spend considerable amount of time on sites like uh, Stack Overflow trying to find the right answers. Uh, once the things like ChatGPT have appeared, the life has become completely different. So in this case, as long as you know what is that you want to accomplish, you can actually ask ChatGPT to write the code to do that. And uh, this is the example of the code that was actually written by the ChatGPT, where I said that, look, I really want to write a code that allows me to take the data set and find the readily average correlation function. So this code is written by ChatGPT. I didn't uh, change it, but I can try to apply it for a data set. Notice that uh, this code is actually came with the mistake. And the mistake is mine because I said that I want to calculate the correlation function, but I didn't say that I want to have this correlation function to be normalized. So you can see that it kind of changes from two to, uh, it kind of changes from two to 12. It's not from zero to one. Nonetheless, using this uh, approach, I can illustrate uh, how the spatial distribution of the features in the image are going to look like. So these are the correlation functions. And basically, if you see the line like this where nothing much is happening, that means that particular image doesn't have a spatial information. If you have the line like this, it means that the image have some spatial information. So this is done for PCA. Notice that we looked at the PCA components from zero to 10. And we saw that some of them have spatial information and some of them do not. But interestingly, component number 28 also has some spatial information. So let's go to our PCA analysis and uh, see what goes on here. So let's change this to P back to the PCA. Let's analyze uh, 40 components. So, so why not? It may take a little bit longer to do it and visualize it, but let's see what happens. So we need to go to the uh, end of our screen. Interesting. Yeah, we don't, we, it looks like we cannot see much. So all of them have some features, but they usually are represented by the small number of pixels. So in this case, looks like it didn't work particularly well. But anyway, okay, now let's look at the two other techniques, which is the k-means clustering and the Gaussian mixture models. So let me pick a, a different data set in this case. So I want to pick the data set number, oops, where are we going? Uh, let me pick the data set number three and uh, repeat the analysis. So we, uh, we reinitialize our variables. So this is our data set. Uh, we can run all this just to make sure. We can uh, do our uh, PCA analysis and uh, look at the results again. So notice what happens here. So in the, for this particular image, the PCA has the three strong components. And by now you can already identify them. So these are the particles. These are the edge plasmons. And this is something unusual that we kind of don't know what it is. Everything else is noise. So now let's do the, okay, let's not do this. Uh, now let's do the k-means clustering. So again, uh, k-means clustering, when you do it in the Python is absolutely trivial. So all we have to do here is to define how many clusters we want to, def uh, to see. So in this case, we said that we want to have uh, four clusters. And basically what we do in this case is that we take all the spectra, we cluster them in four groups, and then we plot the label image. So this is cluster number one, blue. Uh, 
This is how the spectrum corresponding to the cluster one looks like. This is cluster number two, which is uh, the, uh, sorry, this is cluster number two. So this is our clearly our H plasmon. This is our cluster number three, which is uh, the regions inside this uh, object. And this is our cluster number zero, which is also the regions inside the object. So we can change the number of uh, clusters as well. So rather than having, uh, where is it? Rather than having four of them, we can make, for example, two clusters. And uh, if we make two clusters, you will see that here we separated the particles and the substrate. So very simple. If we have the three clusters, We are going to have the, let's see what goes on. So we are going to have the edges, uh, center and the uh, empty space. So the question that you can ask is how do you select the right number of clusters? And equally, uh, how do you select the right number of components if you do the uh, NMF analysis? And the answer is you do it iteratively based on your knowledge of the system. So there are criteria that allow you to say that I need this many components, or this is where I need to do the cutoff. These criteria are usually approximate. They are not rigid. So basically, practically in the real world situations, you define the number of clusters or the number of the NMF components or the thresholds for the PCA components based on the examination of the component spectra based on the examination of the spatial maps and based on your physical common sense. So the good practice in this case, uh, something that you can do now is that if you write a paper and submit it to the journal, uh, you can count on having uh, long discussions with the reviewers, which obviously takes time and effort in uh, justifying why did you choose this particular representation? So one thing that can be very useful to do is to, when you publish the paper, also deposit the notebook that you use for the analysis of the data on the GitHub and provide the link to the notebook from the paper or the preprint. So in this case, anyone who reads your paper can actually rerun the analysis and anyone who reads your paper can also use your code. So that's a very important thing. It's a fairly novel trend in the microscopy community, but it makes all the difference because ultimately if you do some form of analysis, you want to do be traceable and uh, therefore you post code on the GitHub, but you also want other people to be able to use it. And uh, therefore you post the code on the GitHub. Anyway, going back to the a regional data set, if we introduce the large number of clusters, uh, so in this case six, we have the more complex uh, structure inside the, uh, this assembly. So we clearly separated the plasmons on the agent two groups. We clearly separated the central part. We clearly see some variation from the particles and the spaces between the particles. So again, how many components do I need? The answer is it depends what you want to discover. So if you want to find the variability between the particles and the substrate, we need two. If we want to find the edge plasmons, it looks like we need four. If you want to see the additional details, you can do six. So are there any other clustering methods? So there is exceptionally a powerful uh, method called the Gaussian mixture model. So Gaussian mixture model is actually strongly related to the uh, strongly related to the Gaussian processes. In fact, it's one of those methods which is, uh, can be used for elementary uh, problems like denoising or clustering, but it really has a very deep and very fundamental theory behind it. You will not be able to uh, use it to its full strength using the uh, scikit-learn, uh, but uh, generally it is one of those techniques which is worth investing of time and effort into because it really allows you to do very interesting things. So in this case, we use it for clustering to separate our data, same as schemes, separate our data into the several groups of clusters. So we can do it uh, separated into the four clusters, 
uh, we can separate it in the, let's say, six clusters. And uh, we will see roughly the same thing as for the k-means. But as I mentioned, k-means is a very simple method and it's very useful. Uh, JMM is actually a very complex method and it is also extremely useful. When you apply it for the hyperspectral data analysis, you are not going to see much difference. The real difference between this method comes when you start to get to the point of latent mechanisms, meaning if you have some mechanism that produces your data, is it possible to discover this mechanism, sort of to look below the surface of the observation into the deeper physics? So k-means cannot do that. It's kind of operate on the data. If you consider that your data is the interface between the underlying physical reality and your observation, k-means clustering operates on this mechanism. Uh, Gaussian mixture models will delve deep into the physics of the data generation mechanism. But as I said, it will be more visible in a slightly more complex applications. And uh, so again, feel free to experiment with this uh, methods more, uh, number of clusters uh, and so on and so forth. And there's a price game. Let's uh, play with the supervised linear regression. So as you remember, I have shown you in the beginning of the lecture, the example of the data set where we pick uh, three standards, and then we say that we want to decompose the rest of our data set into, the comp into, uh, into these components. So it turns out that we can also do it in Python. So how would I do that? So first of all, I need to select the reference spectrum. And this is the case where the uh, exploratory data analysis becomes uh, very useful. Because basically what I can do is I can use the exploratory data analysis to select the sort of uh, reference points. So in this case, I select two examples from the substrate. I select two examples from the particles. And I select two more examples from these unusual features. So these are my reference points. In this case, I have done it uh, manually. In principle, I can use the peak finding from the scikit uh, signal processing to do the same type of thing. And then if I want to do this uh, regression, all I have to do, uh, ah, then let me show you how the spectra look like. So the spectra from here, spectra from here, and spectra from here will look like this. So I see the difference. They have different intensity of the zero loss peak, and they have a different plasmonic behavior. And then all I can do is uh, I can uh, define the function, which basically tries to take spectrum at each point and uh, represent it as the linear combination of this individual edge spectra. And then I apply this uh, function to my full data set. And as you can see that for the first component, which I've taken outside of the collection of particles, I see that its intensity is uh, one outside and zero inside. The second component that I have chosen to represent the particles, it uh, shows the uh, kind of zeros inside and outside, but shows the gaps between the particles. And the third component, actually, even though I have selected it to be in these bright spots, even though it shows me that it is maximum uh, on the double particles and uh, about one half on the single layer of particles. So just by looking at this data, I will say that uh, my first component is the substrate. My second component is the edge plasmons. And my third component is basically the uh, pl bulk plasmons in these particles. So notice that when I did this attribution, I basically, again, I go forward and backward between the, how the data looks like and how the images uh, formed by the data look like. And then just like last thing, what I can do is I can, if I have three components, I can plot them as the RGB signal components. So this allows to make a nice looking image, which is uh, kind of looks aesthetically appealing. So this being this said, uh, let's uh, stop here. And uh, I would be happy to take questions, if any. Oh, OK, so we have uh, several questions about uh, how many images we require for machine learning. So. I mean, in this case, the answer is slightly different. It all depends on how many images we need. 
uh, sorry, how many images we have and what machine learning method we choose based on the number of images. So for example, if I have a single image, uh, I cannot kind of apply machine learning for the image directly. I need to, uh, I can split it into the image patches and then I analyze the patches one by one, or I can do something else. Something else. Uh, if I have the uh, stack of images, which comes from the, for example, uh, analysis of the videos of or sort of dynamic phase transitions. Uh, in this case, we uh, can analyze the images as a whole. We can also split them in patches. For spectral data set, again, we cannot analyze a single spectrum, but if we have several spectra, we can already do that. So the answer is a little bit different. So we choose the number of, uh, we choose the machine learning method based on the amount of data, not the vice versa. Any more questions? Uh -huh. So how would the approach change if you have multiple uh, channels? So this is a great question. And uh, think about it this way, that virtually all uh, machine learning methods have been developed initially for the image analysis. So the classical image uh, will have three channels. So the intensity of the red, green, and blue signal. So basically, once you have the machine learning method, for example, if you analyze the image, uh, if the image is the grayscale, you just take a image patch. But if the image is multi-channel, then your analysis object is basically like an Oreo cookie. It's a patch that will have three channels. In fact, uh, this is uh, so uh, preponderant that if you go through the standard uh, machine learning frameworks like Keras or PyTorch, they basically converge to the uh, setting where your dimensionality of the data object is the, is the built-in. So it's number point in the batch, uh, number of channels, height, width, and then depth and time. So basically the machine learning community converge to the data format which is most universal to the color uh, videos. And that kind of makes a lot of sense. Once we develop our own approaches, for example, if you want to analyze the multiple channels in the image and spectral data, the question becomes, how do you want to treat these channels? So the simplest way is to just append them to each other. So imagine that you take a spectroscopy data set in AFM where you measure the current as the function of voltage and you measure the displacement and the fun function of voltage. So you can either analyze them separately, current separately, displacement separately, or you can append them and you can analyze them jointly. Or you can analyze them separately and look at the correlations between the two channels. So which of these ways you choose depends on the physical problem you try to solve. If you want to understand the variability of the conductive behavior, you take the current channel. If you want to understand the variability of the tip surface forces, you take the high channel. If you want to understand the variability in the material, then you append current and voltage. And if you want to understand the correlation between the current response and, volt and the uh, structural response, then you look at the cross correlations between the current and the uh, displacement channel. So again, you choose the machine learning method and you choose the feature that you use in machine learning method based on what is that that you want to explore. Any more questions? Okay, so if you have questions, please uh, raise your hand. If not, then uh, let's uh, call it a day. Uh, let me see if there are any hands raised, apparently not. So for the next several lectures, we will go through the analysis of the imaging data using the classical methods. So things like image registration and so on. This is exceptionally important if you want to understand the relationship between the spectral and structural data sets.
uh, and uh, Professor uh, Dusher is going to actually talk about it. And uh, after these lectures, we actually will start to dive into the machine learning proper, including the use of the DCNNs for image analysis, including the Gaussian processes, and including running the how would you run the automated experiment. So again, notice that the course is divided between the elementary part and more complex part. The reason why elementary part is necessary is because uh, otherwise there is a very high probability of analyzing the data, which is kind of um, contaminated by the instrumental artifact. So that's really not a good idea. The good thing is that, of course, choose the lectures that match your interests and background, and the lectures, as before, would be recorded and deposited on YouTube. Thank you, and have a good Friday. <laughs>